Look at this. I got my environment working. I think I just needed to restart it. It started working. So it's awesome. We had the exam on Monday. Uh, we'll see. I'm working on making an exam for Friday. We'll get through the, the PDFs, the application part. Hopefully, it wasn't too bad. Really straightforward. I told you what tests to run. Final exam is a week and a half. Right? That's not yeah. It's a Friday of finals, right? Monday. 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 Final. Monday before Thanksgiving. So uh, so the plan is to get the theoretical part up, the application part up, so you can use the weekend to work through it. All right, and then the theoretical part, it's the quiz on, black, on Blackboard or the exam on Blackboard, uh, that'll go live on Monday morning, and then you can take it you know, anytime during that day. All right, so I'm around all of that Monday, or I'm available all of that Monday. I postponed the blood donation for Tuesday, which used to be a good thing because it had movie day, movie ticket day Tuesdays. Two free movie tickets. Forgiven blood? Not anymore. What's that? Forgiven blood? Yeah. What? They get to choose the movie? They give you a ticket to go see the movie. No, no, but like they choose which movie. No, no, no. Just for the theater here. Oh. But Cinemark? Oh. I still had four or six oh. tickets. I mean, everything shut down. I was saving them. I save them up. It's like, oh man, what movie was supposed to come out this, this summer? Uh, yeah, they, there was a bunch of movies that were supposed to come out this summer. But I was looking forward to it. It's like, oh, we use these movies? What we save on tickets then gets spent on popcorn. So, but, right. it's, it's to be expected. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've used it to see. Uh, let's see, we didn't use it. I didn't have to use it for Wonder Woman. No, uh, Captain Marvel. Because we saw it on a Tuesday, and apparently, like Tuesday evening at the theater was like family night, so they were like five dollar tickets. So I didn't want to waste my free tickets on five dollar tickets. Oh yeah, we paid for Star Wars, Solo. Saw that. But anyways, I'll be around. All right, so we left off here. We're violating assumptions of ANOVA. All right, check our assumptions. Very important. Uh, probably the easiest assumption if we're going to violate is like violations of normality because we can continue using an ANOVA. If I have to violate an assumption, a, a different assumption, it's going to be equal variances because we have Welch's ANOVA available to us. And we run it using this one -way test function and we get our output and it's just, we report the same thing now. If our p-value is greater than 0.05 for the Welch's ANOVA, we know that there's no difference in mean. So our, if we look at our uh, hypotheses, null hypothesis is that the mean, means are equal. Our alternate is that uh, at least one is different from the rest. All right, so if we get a p-value greater than 0.05, we just we stop. We know there's no difference in means. But if we have a difference in means, if we know if we get a p-value that's less than 0.05, 
we have to go that next step and figure out which mean is different. So we can't use a two keys or a donut because both of them have the same assumptions of a nova. You know, they rely on that equal variance assumption. All right. So what we're going to run is a pairwise or a pairwise test. All right. We're going to run them ourselves. All right. What we have to do though is save our p value and then adjust it. And that gets us back to a family-wise alpha level of 0.05. All right, so how are we gonna run this? We're gonna run this setting up subsets. All right, and we're gonna set up our subsets so that we have every combination that we're going to compare. So we had A, B, C, and D. We want an A, B, an A, C, and A, D group. We want a B, C, B, D group, and then we want a C, D group. So we've got six subsets. And then from that subset, we're going to pass that subset to the data function. So the only thing that ultimately changes with all of our t-tests is this data set. So here's how I created my subsets uh, in the presentation. But go back to R. This is how I did it. This is how I did it in Markdown, R Studio. So. I read in my Oaks data set. I'm going to run car library just so it can run. All right, we looked at it. Uh, we did our Levine test, our one way test, right? We get our results. This is how I did the subset. So we're going to take a subset of our original data frame, Oaks, and we're setting up a selection. So we only want to keep the rows where site is equal to A or site is equal to B. Note the double equal sign. That represents our logical comparison. All right, and note that I use quotation marks around the A and B because those are actual levels in that, that site variable. All right? And what I did was I saved each of our subsets as a different name, Oaksat AB, Oaksat AC, Oaksat AD, and, and so forth. All right? And then what we're going to do is run a series of pairwise tests. So we ran this one. We're testing diameter as a function of site. We're going to see if diameter differs between the sites. All right. We can run a t-test because our data set only has sites A and B in it. And with this, we want var dot equal equals false because we violated that equal variance assumption. And when I ran it, I got, whoops, let me run this first. There we go. There's all my data sets, my subsets. I run this, I get this output, I get my first p-value. All right. Now, you might be tempted to interpret this and say, yeah, there's a difference between these, but we can't do that yet. All right. Because we, this is only at 0.05. All of the collection is going to change our family-wise alpha level. So what I did was took that p-value and started saving it in a, in a vector. All right. So I know this works. Then what I'm going to do is copy this. And we had a total of six comparisons, right? And the only thing that we change now is our subset. B, C, B, D, C, D. Right. And run it. And here is the trouble. It lines up everything right in a row, all right? And this doesn't really tell us what our data set is. It doesn't tell us what data set is in the output. It keep, it's the only thing that's going to change are basically our test statistics or values. So what we have to do is kind of keep track of what we have. So I already entered in that p-value. So I'm going to go to that next p-value. I'm going to copy it, move down, and paste it. Three is point one seven two nine. Comma. Four. This is five. And our last. All right, so each of these has a 0.05 type 1 error rate. All right, 
much. So each time we had a, an error rate, a 5% or five percent chance of committing a type 1 error, which is rejecting when we should not reject it. All right. Collectively, if we've got 5% there and 5% here and 5% here and 5% here, 5% here and 5% here, the probability that we've commit, committed a type 1 error at least one time all right, is going to be much higher than 5%. So what we're going to have to do is adjust our p-value. So I've created this p-value vector, all right? And then what we're going to have to do is use the p.adjust function on our p-value. Okay, what we're going to do is basically adjust these p-values. And what you'll see is that our p-values will increase. Our p-values will increase, which means we have a possibility where we take a p-value that get, says we have a difference in mean, all of a sudden changes, and now we conclude that it's not different. All right, so p-dot-adjust p-value. Now we've got a choice. Get back here. p-dot-adjust methods. There it is. Our method specifies how we're going to adjust our p-value. All right, so I'm going to go to the help file. And look at it. This. Oh. And you can see that p.adjust has all of these different methods of adjustment. Right? None doesn't adjust our p-value at all. Uh, it's, we're going to report our, our regular p-value. You've got Holm, Hotchberg, Hommel, Bonferroni, BH, BY, FDR. Feel free to look any of these up. They have different purposes, different, di different usages, uh, depending on what type of analysis you're looking at and whether or not you're trying to control type 1 or type 2 error rates. All right, for us, the two that we're going to use is Holm and Bonferroni. Why is, do we use those two? Well, Bonferroni is the most common one. All right? It is most common uh, because you can actually use Bonferroni adjustments to figure out what your new critical value would be, which the new critical value is actually a smaller p-value. So to find that, it's pretty easy. There's an equation to take your 0.05 and... it by, I believe, the number of comparisons that you have. So if you have two comparisons that you're making, it should reduce, I believe it reduces our critical value to 0.025. Don't quote me on that, but that's kind of how, how you can do it by hand. So that's, you, it's easy to do by hand to figure out your new critical value. That's why Bonferroni was probably uh, most common use. And then stats programs on the computer started adding this in. It was common. They said this is the one we're going to make as default. Downside of Bonferroni, though, is that uh, it doesn't have as much power as some other method. And that is where Holm comes into play. All right? And this is going to be the one that, that, that we recommend, or that I'm going to recommend using. You could use either. We did all those. We can do either. But in terms of having a choice, I probably would lean more towards home because if there's a difference, home is going to is more likely to find it than Bonferroni. You can say Bonferroni is a bit more conservative in the test. So if there's a question, it'll probably err on the side of saying there is no difference. Uh, but usually, in terms of our, our analysis, we're always tend to be interested in finding those differences. So I would suggest Holm. Now, how do we do that? How do we specify? It's really easy. We just do method equals, and then in quotation marks, the method that, that we want to use. So we can spell it out, or we can use abbreviations. All right, so what R will do is look at what abbreviation you use, and then figure out which one matches. 
if I used H, it's not going to work because we have three of these that all begin with an H. If I use HO, it's still not going to work because I've got three of them. But if I use HOL, R is going to know which one I want. I want home. All right? Now, home is a four-letter word. Right? I like to use just home, write it out. But if I have Bonferroni, that's a pretty complicated word to spell. You're going to say, is it two Fs? Is it two Ns? Is it one N? You know, is, there a, is it a Y or an I at the end? Who knows? So for that, you can just use B-O-N-F, B-O-N-F for Bonf, and it works. So here's our, our home, method home. What it does is takes all of our p-values and then adjusts them. Now, I don't like how it converts everything to scientific notation. So we went from 0.00684 to 0.0137. Our p-value increased in size. That's what our adjustments are doing. It's increasing the p-values to make it less likely that we create a type 1 error. And in fact, we're adjusting our p-values so that the chance of making at least one type 1 error is no higher than 5%. That's what we're doing. So it's these numbers, then, that we use to, to determine which ones are different. So if we go up here, we did AB, AC, AD, B, C, B, D, B, C, yeah, B, D, and C, D. That was the order. So then I look at this output. That's significant. So I know A and B are not significantly different. Uh, A and B, the means are different. Negative 12, yeah, A and C is different. This is 0.017. Nope, I'm sorry, 0 0.17. 0.17. A and D, the means are not different. Negative 9, yeah, definitely different. That's BC. Negative 3, that's definitely different, BD. And negative 4, that's definitely different. So the only means that are not different is that AD comparison. All other comparisons are, are significantly, significantly different from each other. All right. If I wanted to do Bonferroni, I could change this to BONF, or I could spell out Bonferroni if you want. And I get same types of adjustments. And if you look, we would arrive at the same conclusion. This third one, this third comparison, this third p-value is the only one that is not significant. And that corresponds to our AD comparison. So it means A and D are not different from each other. So in our presentation, I showed both. And how they approach the p-values are going to be a slightly different, how they, how they adjust them. Uh, that kind of leads to the difference in power of our tests. So here's our comparison side by side. So you can see, basically, I, I highlighted all of the spots where we have a significant difference. So the only ones that didn't was AD, and in this case, Bonferroni and Holm gave the same answer. I think in a lot of cases, you're going to get the same answer regardless of which method you choose. And that's why you can kind of choose whichever one you use. Uh, I think in psychology papers, Bonferroni is like the gold standard for them. If you used Holm, you'll probably make their heads explode. So, and Biology, it's, it's less critical. Right. Home will work. All right, so how do we report this? Here's an example. So instead of using the box plots, I went ahead and grabbed the, the means, grabbed the standard errors, made my own graph in Excel. All right, and this one, this was actually made in R. Uh, I thought I would have provided the code, but if you're curious, I can provide the code on how to make it. All right. But again, what I did was used my letters, my subscript, my small letters to indicate differences or lack thereof between our means. So I specify that in our figure legend. Sites with different lowercase letters are significantly different based on Welch's t-test with home adjustment. All right. So a couple things you're going to notice here. All right. One, I said what type of adjustment we 
I used home adjustment. Right? And we had to do that because we're doing multiple pairwise t-tests. A Welch's t-test right, is only two groups. So if we're going to report differences in means based on Welch's t-test, we needed an, an adjustment. So I used home. Number two, my p-value is p with adj in a subscript. It's to indicate to the reader that this is an adjusted p-value. Right, we didn't change our critical value. We actually adjusted our p-values. All right. So that was in the figure. I was a little bit more specific in the actual write-up in the text. So I've got my figure legend, and by rule, all right, our figure legends should the figure should stand by themselves. They should be self-explanatory in the context of our, our caption. So our legend itself, I think, explains everything, explains what everything is there, minus the standard errors, minus the standard errors. So in our write-up, we investigated diameter of oak trees in several areas. Uh, quantile, quantile plots suggest that diameters are normally distributed within each site. All right, that's our first assumption check. Variances are unequal. I used brown foresight, gave my F statistic and the p-value, all right, so Welch's ANOVA suggests diameters differ between the sites. Right. Test, test statistic, degrees of freedom, p-value, conclusion. Right. Pairwise, Welch's t-test with home adjustment. That is what we did as a post hoc. They were used as post hoc tests. Diameters at site A and D were similar. There's our p-adjusted point, less than 0.17. That's what Holmes gave us from R. That was in R. And diameters at site B and C differ from the rest. So A and D are similar, and then site B and C are different from all of the all of the other comparison. And that summarizes exactly what we found. Note how I took a shorthand. So up here, I said everything was less than 0.05. All right. I could have said less than 0.01 if I if I wanted to. But definitely in the text, I'm clarifying that yeah, we had 0.17. For one comparison, and then all the other comparisons were below 0 0.01. Questions? All right, example two, flower.csv. All right, so download it, import it into R. Download it, import it into R. I'll say we did Welch's t-test. You could have also done pairwise Welch's ANOVA, uh, and you'll get similar p-values. So let me, let me get that. The t test and ANOVAs work. I did the last, these last three, uh, because they show us we can get all of our p values in. Uh, so our last three p values, that value, point, uh, 1.091 e to the negative ninth, that's the same that Welch's would give us. 0. 0.000973 is the same that Welch's. 0 0.00131 is the same. So with an ANOVA, if we only have two groups, we get the same p-value t-test. But I think P, some people might panic if you said, oh, I'll use pairwise Welch's ANOVA. Sticklers are going to say, no, ANOVA is for three or more groups. 
then you have to correct me. Ask me how I can. All right, you get your data set loaded into R, flower.csv. So here's the setup. Uh, you find a plant with flowers that vary in the color. During one growing season, you harvested seed from the plant and discovered that some flowers produce more seeds that survive to maturity than others. So you think flower color might be contributing to offspring survival. Thus, you collected seeds from different colored flowers and determined how many seeds survive to maturity. Question, does flower color affect survival of our offspring? All right, so in the data set, we have two variables. We have an independent variable, that's our color. Right? Our dependent variable is survival, uh, you know, how many seeds survived to maturity. So it's a, or kind of, I can't remember what, what variable name it was. Uh, but first, so we know we've got two of these variables, one categorical, one continuous. We know to answer this question, we're going to be uh, interested in using ANOVA. So check our assumptions. Which assumption was violated? What do you think? What about equal variance? Yeah. All right, so we've got, here's my R. I've already loaded in the flower. There it is. All right. So we asked, does flower color affect the number of seeds that, that survive to maturity? All right. So our null hypothesis is that our means are equal. The mean number of seeds that survive is equal across those, those colors. All right. Our alternate is that the means are not equal. All right. the means are not equal. So first up, we know we want to do an ANOVA, or we think we want to do an ANOVA. First up, we check our assumptions. The first assumption that we check is the normality assumption. And we've already had one say, yeah, it looks non-normal. I tend to agree. All right. So we do. It's a it's a discrete variable. So you know, it's whole numbers only. That's why we have this ladder-like structure. But I think it's pretty clear that we kind of have this curvature. Red is less so, but like, look at the white. I mean, you got an excess number down here, and then it kind of picks up. You've got green, where like below. I think there's some curvature going on. There's some skew. So I don't think this is normally distributed. I don't think this is normally distributed. So, because it's not normal, how do we check our equal variance assumption? Which one? Flinger clean. Oops. Survive as a function of color. data equals flower, all right? So I think we're going to, maybe it's normal. I'm going to say it's probably non-normal. So I lean towards Flickner clean test. We get a p-value of 0.8854. Yeah, our variances are equal. So this assumption that we violated is normality. 
violated, or we're, we think we violated the normality assumption. Right? It's the, the discrete character that kind of throws things off. All right, so here's, here's our QQ plots. Fligner, Colleen. All right, so data are non-normal within each group. Variances are equal, so now what do we do? So here's our options. One, we run ANOVA as, as usual. ANOVA is robust to this normality uh, assumption. All right, and definitely, if we have equal sample sizes across the colors, it's really robust. All right, so how many samples do we have? What is our sample size? What is our sample size for each of the colors? How do we find out? What do you think? What's that? What if we just do summary? That can work. That can work. What about this one? <laughs> Overthought it. <laughs> Frequency tables. That's what that's what we're interested in. So summary will give it to us. Uh, again, we tend not to have an overly large number of categories. As we teach this, because as we start getting up to you know, 10, 15 multiple comparisons, you lose the ability to detect the difference unless you've got a really large sample size. All right, so we typically have a few numbers, but I think with the summary, it caps it on how many categories it gives us. I think it gives us like an other category just to kind of group everything else. All right, so the table function, though, gives us everything. So you can see we've got 50, 60, 70, and 80. If these were all, let's say 50, or all 60, or all 70, I definitely would say that ANOVA is pretty good with handling that ANOVA. So really robust if we're sample sizes are equal. I think we're at the point where our sample sizes are probably unequal enough to where we, we might not want to run this ANOVA. Now, now, how much of a difference are we talking about? All right, so if we were like between 55 and 65, those are pretty darn close. But given our numbers, 50 to 80, that's a 30, 30 item swing. Now, if we had changed those to, you know, 550 to 580, yeah. That's not really a huge difference. Yeah, it's still 30, but we're talking about over 500 per group. Right. So option one is just to run our ANOVA as normal, and you know how to do that. All right. If we run an ANOVA, though, all right, remember that since we violated this normality assumption for ANOVA, we have also violated that normality assumption for the Tukey's post hoc test. All right. So we don't have to check it again. We've already checked it for the ANOVA. Whatever we found, whatever assumptions we violated for ANOVA also violated it for our, for our post hoc test. So could we run a regular two keys? No, we can't. Two keys is not robust to this assumption. So even though we can run a regular ANOVA, we can't run a regular two keys in this case. Now again, if our sample sizes are equal and large, the robustness of two keys becomes okay. We can get away with it, but my recommendation is no. If we violated normality, our, our post-hoc test shouldn't be two keys. Option number two, and, and we'll come back to, to what our options are with that. Option number two is to run a crucial wallace test. crucial wallace test is a non-parametric version of ANOVA. It's our, it's our non-parametric version of ANOVA. Put that down. Uh, it basically compares our medians. That's what it is. It's not, it's not our means. So it changes our, our null and alternate hypothesis. Remember, we wanted to compare our, our mean. That's what we wanted to compare 
Crucial Wallace is going to change that to comparing the median. If we're skew, perhaps medians are a more appropriate measure, which means we could run a Crucial Wallace test. Downside of this, Crucial Wallace, is that our variances have to be equal. In this case, they are. So we're fine with running it. But we would have to know that we have the same general distribution within each group. So that's like the other part that, of the assumption for Crucible Wallace test. Not only are our variants have to be equal, but we have to have the same general distribution in each group. So you can look at the QQ plot. If our non-normality, that curvature, is the same in all of our groups, then we can run a Crucible Wallace test. But if we're skewed right in some groups and skewed left in other groups, we can't run this test at all. All right, so if we're all in the same skew, that's pretty good. What do we have here? I'm going to go back to our QQ plots. It looks like we have about the same skew. Now, how much skew we have varies for each of our groups. Some are more pronounced than others. In some groups, that like this is, I think, pretty clear. With the curvature, this one is like a steeper, sharper curve. All right, this one to you, like really long tail, and then all of a sudden it, it gradually increases. I think I would be okay using Crucible Wallace in this case because we're all we're showing curvature in the same area, but I would be be a little cautious because we're not showing the same types of, of of the same amount of skew. It doesn't look like we're seeing the same amount of skew. Uh, so if we wanted to run this. And, you know, we, I mean, these assumptions are met. How do we run it? Well, we have a crystal.test function. Right? Crystal.test function. This is built into R. We don't have to load any packages. We write it as crystal.test. We do survive as a function of color with data equals flower. We, we write it just like we, we've been doing. We write our formula. And we get this output. Right? So go ahead and run it in R. Make sure it works for you. Make sure you get this output. Then we'll talk about it. when it works, all right? So you're going to get the same output. Gives us the test that we ran, Crystal Wallace rank sum test, all right? And we're comparing our medians, all right? Crystal Wallace chi-square. So our test statistic is a chi-squared test statistic, all right? It's 15.716 degrees of freedom is three. So we've got four colors minus one. That gives us three groups, three degrees of freedom. I should say four groups minus one is three degrees of freedom. And our p-value is 0.001296. So there's a difference. Is it a difference in mean? No, it's not a difference in mean. It's a difference in median. However, if we have the same skew, same general distribution in each group, then that pattern of how medians are related to, to means still holds up. So if there's a difference in the medians, there's likely a difference in the means as well. But even though that part's true, I would still write it up as say, specifying that the median diameters differ between the sites. Maybe in the discussion then I go, I explain that, yeah, it, the medians are different, which since we have similar shapes, the means are likely different as well, but we didn't test the means, we tested the medians. All right, so we've got our conclusion, we compared the medians, our test is Crystal Wallace, test statistics at chi-squared, degrees of freedom three, p-values less than 0 .00. For school. Is that? So that'd be, so the write up would be that a median shows viability differs between colors. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why, why I did diameters. Yeah, median, median number that survived. All right, so we found a difference in the medians. What's our next step? Well, 
We can't run two keys. Two keys compares means. And we violated normality. So if we're going to go that next step, our basic options is to continue with these non-parametric tests, which is a pairwise Gruska-Wallis test. And we do them the exact same way. All right, we create our subsets for the different colors. All right. And then we run our tests on each of those subsets. We save our p-value, and then we adjust our p-values. All right. Now, Kruskal Wallace test is analogous to an ANOVA, right? ANOVA and the t tests are related. If you run an ANOVA on two groups, you'll get the same p-value as a t-test. Right? Similar things apply with the non-parametric versions. Kruskal Wallace is meant for three or more groups. Right? If you only have two groups, then that p-value for a Kruskal Wallace will be the same as a Wilcoxon Dine rank test. All right. All right. I'm sorry. Man Whitney test. I should say Man Whitney test. But we use it using Wilcox that test. All right. So let's do it. Create your subsets. All right. Create your subsets. Run all your pairwise tests, and I would probably use a test since we get the same p-values. And then adjust your p-values using either Holm or Bonferroni. And we'll see if we get the same answers. To what we're doing.
دیگه Finish it up on Friday. We will talk about the results of this. We'll look at what I did, how I got it, and then the summary. Now, remember, as you do this, come up with a summary of how you would how you would present these differences or lack thereof. All right, and remember, we didn't compare the means; we compared the medians with these tests. All right. So we'll do this, and then we'll get into the fun stuff, which is randomization tests. That's where the real fun begins in class.